Dr. Moody, good to see you again. It's been a while. Hello. It has been. I was trying to remember, Mark, and my name is Raymond, by the way. I, I know. I'm it's trying to hand the tide out a little bit from that label. I, that thing <laughs> on America's Most Wanted, it was all made up, though. But, <laughs> you know, as I recall, Mark, it was over 20 years ago, wasn't it, that we met down in Florida, and it was where a... Um, Oh, uh, Nori, George Nori was there. Yeah, yeah, George was there, and Dave Schrader was there, yeah. and uh, I think it was at the Pensacola Paracon, of all, of all places. But I remember, and what really stands out in my mind, is you were giving a presentation, and I was supposed to go next, so, you know, I'm waiting, and all of a sudden, the moderator comes and goes, um, Dr. Moody, your time is up. And I'm like horrified, okay? This is like saying, okay, Beatles, the Beatles can't play anymore. Mark's gone. And I'm like, no, and you were so kind. And you said, Mark, this is your time. And I've never forgotten that. That was one of the nicest, nicest things. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I remember meeting you and that was, you know, I'm astonished. A long time ago, I yeah. Realized that was before my grown kids were even born. Oh, wow. we, Cheryl and I have two. I say little ones now, 23 and 21, both adopted at birth. And that was before they came along. So that wow. was a long time ago. Wow. Now, so do you remember the date that you met him? No, I don't remember. Because Florida, no, I don't remember. It, 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 it was hot, which you know, in Florida is like, you know, could be nine months out of the year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Raymond's good at remembering exact dates, so. I, I often am, yeah. Yeah, it's like October 4th, 1492. Well, <laughs> I'm talking about and, and Paul, I remember you. I told you, as soon as I saw him, I'm like, oh, that guy. <laughs> so. yeah, he was, he was I, don't, I don't remember what the conference was. Um, it was a double tree. Yeah, was it, was it in, in Denver? It was either in, oh, Denver, in Scottsdale. Scottsdale, Scottsdale. So yeah, yeah, okay. Um, was that in that was at IONS, wasn't it? Or was that at the AREI? I mean, it's AREI. That's what it was. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah, yeah. Well, fantastic. Well, I appreciate you having me on the podcast. I've been really excited, really looking forward to this. Yeah. Hey, I have a question for you. Okay, so you're psychic. Your right. parents, are, your parents are psychic. Right. Uh, your grandparents. One, I think one of your grandparents is psychic. Yeah, my maternal great grandmother Giovanna, and, yeah. and my dad's uh, maternal grandmother um, Grace. Yeah. And any brothers and sisters are they psychic? I have an older brother and older sister, and they're intuitives. They're not necessarily mediums, and. Um, it's funny, my brother is, is like really good at anticipating future events, yeah. and, uh, but he's scared of it. And he was talking to me on the phone one day and he goes, I got a bad feeling something's going to happen to my son, like he's going to get cut or something. I go, that's really terrible. And all of a sudden I hear in the background, dad, I just cut myself out And he was working on something outside and a knife slipped and he slid his palm open. My brother's like, gotta go, you know, and... <laughs> So you have all these psychics in your family. You must have the quietest Thanksgiving dinner of anybody in the world. No, we're Italian. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That explains well, that. My, my dad's family was, was English. My mother's family was Italian. I oh, was my like, goodness. Okay. Yeah, I always said it was like being Mr. Spock, you know, half Falcon, half, you know. <laughs> I hope the Italian half did the cooking, may I say. Yes, they did. Thank God. And, uh, <laughs> they were glad. He's you, glad. You know how it is. <laughs> yeah. You it, haven't been to any English restaurants lately. <laughs> I know. It, how many times? Uh, let's go out for... Uh, Italian, Spanish, Chinese, Japanese, no English restaurants. Yep, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> You know, so, every place, every place in the world has a has an Irish pub, though, which is as worse than English cooking. <laughs> I think it's the beer. <laughs> beer, you have to drink beer to eat. Got to drink beer. <laughs> My favorite cuisine is Indian. Oh, and, I, love and I discovered it 
in June of 1969 in London at the Golden Shalimar because the English restaurants were so bad. But they said, oh, the, you know, the, <laughs> the Indian restaurant is great. So, oh, oh, my God. I had chicken biryani and, and uh, puri and um, uh, mango chutney. Wow. I, I think they had such a, a huge empire because they were trying to get away from their food. I think you're right. Let's find something that tastes good. <laughs> Captain Cook's secret purpose was to, to go find the cuisines of the world. Of course, then he went over and stole Hawaiian food. And that's, he was on the wrong boat. Um, let's get on with your book. How's that? Uh, Sounds good. What, uh, my uh, general question is, what do you mean by afterlife frequency? The afterlife frequency is, is for all intents and purposes, the other side. And I, I look at it like this. We live in AM radio, okay, because everything has vibration and frequency. And when we die, our soul, it's like a drop of water and it's pure energy because I created the term or developed the term, the electromagnetic soul. And um, our soul is like a drop of water that when we die, it plunges into this eternal sea of consciousness. So if you will, it quantum leaps from AM radio to FM radio, which is the higher vibrational frequency. And, and the funny thing is about that, Paul, I was trying to figure out what to call this book. And I had all these different titles and I was, I took a walk down on the beach one day and I'm, I'm thinking, well, it's about the afterlife and it's about frequency and then it, the afterlife frequency. So I, I run home because I live near the beach and I, I start searching afterlife frequency, title of books. No book was using it. I called my publisher. I, I ran it by the editor. And she goes, oh my God, I love it. That's it. And, and so that, that's how it happened. Um, but the afterlife frequency is the higher vibration that, that we go to. Now, what's fascinating, and this ties in certainly to, to your work, to Dr. Moody's work, and to, to Lisa's work, is that, so where do NDEs occur? Where does mediumship occur? Shared death experiences, deathbed visions, astral projections. They all occur in the zone between the material world and the afterlife frequency. Because what happens is, you know, we have five different brainwave frequencies, gamma, beta, alpha, theta, delta, right? Gamma is the super high frequency. That's Matt Amodio, Amy Schneider on Jeopardy. Okay, that's just, you know, you're, you're really revving your brain at full force. Beta would be the state that we're in right now. That's the um, state where we're able to, you know, functions of daily living, doing some complex problems. But as we begin to relax or if you meditate or you begin to drift into the daydream state and then into a restful state, you go into alpha. But it's on the alpha theta border where it's been determined that psychic activity occurs. And spirits are able to spot that. So they bring their vibrational frequency down and we bring ours up and we get a frequency match. And it's my theory, and I explain this in the afterlife frequency, that that's the same for all forms of after-death communication, whether it's contact through a medium like myself, or perhaps you have a visitation in a dream, or you feel a loved one around and you're not necessarily a medium. What happens in a near-death experience, because you're in the transition between our frequency and this eternal frequency of the afterlife, same thing with shared death experiences when more than one person is experiencing this. So that in a nutshell is how I came up with the term or the afterlife frequency. Okay. So when you talk about, <clears throat> I'm sorry, it's emerging of alpha beta. It's um, yeah, it's on the alpha theta border. Theta, okay. You know, I've been tested in, in other mediums. I know they, they hooked us. I remember the first time I had uh, positronic emission tomography. I look like an electronic Medusa. I mean, I had all these, <laughs> these um, uh, hookups to my head, uh, electrodes. And so what happens is when we start communicating with spirits, we're transmitting 
or transitioning rather from the beta wave frequency to the alpha theta border. And everybody's capable of doing this, but normally it takes hours to accomplish this in the sleep state. And that's why uh, spirit communication in dreams is the most popular or, or most reported form of spirit communication. What those of us who are studying mediums, what we don't understand is how people like me can go from beta to alpha theta within seconds. And that's what we're still not entirely sure how that happens. Hmm. How do you think it happens? Can I, I mean, I was, yeah, go, go ahead. I have a question about that. Um, I've been reading a lot about shared death experiences lately. As you know, that was a term that uh, Raymond coined and Paul developed in the book, Glimpses of Eternity. And I've been reading and thinking about them. And I know that when my father passed away, I very much felt like I was having shared death experiences with him. And it seemed to change my frequency because all of a sudden I was connecting with spirit in ways that I had never had before. And it may have lasted as long as six months. Is that common or how do you explain that? And um, Well, the lasting six months is, is quite unique. And first off, Raymond, thank you for developing the term shared death experience because that term needed to be developed because this phenomenon has been reported for centuries and now it's being reported globally. And it's very, very important. And I've been at the bedside of a number of people who were transitioning and people who were not mediums were seeing spirits and having ex uh, experiences exactly like you're explaining, Lisa. The way I explain it in the afterlife frequency is we've all seen the, the uh, incandescent bulbs. All right. The, you know, the old style, the Thomas Edison developed uh, a light bulb. And, you know, now we're getting into LED, so, so they're getting away from this. But before an, um, an incandescent bulb burns out, there's a flash of light. It gets real bright. We've all seen that. You know, and then you hear a pop. What's going on there is that the tungsten in the filament is no longer able to regulate the amount of electricity that typically goes through the light bulb. All right? It begins to degrade. And it's the same thing with the human brain. The brain does not create consciousness, it merely hosts it. Every spiritual teacher from the sages of ancient India through Zoroaster, through Moses, Buddha, Jesus, Muhammad, Lao Tzu, um, St. Francis, Gandhi, Native American spirituality, all hold that the soul, the who and what we are, pre-exists the body, comes into the body, moves on after the body dies. The laws of thermodynamics and physics teaches us that energy is neither created nor destroyed, only transferred from one form to another. You guys all study the human brain. You know it's got an electrical field, all right? And we all know that on the subatomic level, the basic unit of creation is the quantum. You know, from quantum, then we go to electrons, protons, neutrons, into atoms, into molecules, etc. So what's happening is when a person is transitioning, their brain is beginning to degrade, and like the tungsten in the filament of an incandescent bulb, it's no longer able to handle that amount of energy, so that if there's an energy spike, and the frequency of the transitioning person's electromagnetic soul now begins to interface, not just with the afterlife frequency. That's why people have deathbed visions and they say, oh my gosh, I'm seeing Aunt Martha and Uncle Bob and all these people that I love who died, but people in close proximity, family members, close friends, hospice workers, people that, that have no emotional connection, they get caught up in this frequency overlap. And I think that, that shared death experiences um, it, are very, very similar to terminal lucidity where somebody who is, is dying and they've been non-responsive. It could be from Alzheimer's, brain tumors, brain damage, um, all sorts of uh, different causes of, of um, yeah. like no brainwave activity at all. And then all of a sudden, right before death, there's a surge of activity and they're lucid and they can communicate with people. Why? Well, we know that I think one thing all neuroscientists, neurobiologists in the world agree on is that you suddenly don't grow a billion new neurons right before you die. 
And so what's happening in terminal lucidity and what's happening in shared death experiences, I think that this demonstrates that what Dr. Moody's theory about shared death experiences is absolutely correct. It's that the energy of the electromagnetic soul is transitioning away from being contained in a, um, a brain, a computer hard drive. You know, your computer hard drive does, didn't create Windows 10 or 11. It merely hosts it. So as the hard drive brain is crashing, that energy is expanding and people in close proximity, their EMSs start picking up on it too, which is why, Lisa, that when your father was transitioning, you experienced that. Now, in your case, the way it lasted for another six months, I have a, um, I have a feeling that because of the work that you do, you're very open-minded to spirit contact, and that sort of flipped your switch on. <laughs> I think that's true. Yeah, thank you. Very interesting. And can I, I'm really curious, Raymond, about what you think about some of the ideas yeah. about frequency and that, you know, some of the things that Mark Anthony is talking about, because I know sometimes you've been a little skeptical about some of the more modern neuroscience. Do you, I'm just curious what your thoughts are as we're having this conversation today. Do you have? Well, I greatly respect the neurosciences, and it's a great area of research. And also, uh, you know, of course, as you know, in my medical education, I had to take a great deal of that. And um, so, and at the same time, I realized I am not competent really to assess that general area. I have been more focused on the conscious part of it and the whole mystery of consciousness and um so um but in terms of the uh of the relationship of of this to frequency and so on I, again i'm not an expert in physics but um I do, I mean, this, there is one thing that has come to my mind as I was listening to Mark talk is, um, it's fairly frequent people talk about this, uh, this sort of, uh, this period just before the moment of leaving their body, I guess, uh, in terms of a vibration, I've heard that, or sometimes like a sound, which they find very difficult to describe. But again, I mean, I'm not fascinated to listen to this and at the same time have to admit that, you know, I just, uh, I guess, um, you know, I mean, I took physics, but it was a long time ago. So <laughs> frequency kind of drifted you know, out. Uh, yeah. People who study quantum physics say that um, the laws of physics change at the extremes. So if you consider death to be an extreme, mm. and it would fit mm. into that paradigm. That's beautiful. But, you know, the rules of physics change when they're dealing with, as Raymond, who's an expert on outer space and things, it, they, they change in deep outer space. Yeah. Uh, and some people, some psychologists, psychiatrists say that it, de death is the same thing. Death is an extreme, and it causes the rules of physics to change. However, when, when you say something like afterlife frequency, are you talking about electrical frequency, electromagnetic frequency? Because I, I don't know that there's a, uh, any studies that show that that lasts very long. Well, if I, mean, you, I do believe it does, but yeah. there's not many studies about it. There's none that I know of. I'm referring to as part of the EM spectrum, because if you think about it, the only form of electromagnetic energy visible to the human eye is light. And that is what, like 1% of the EM spectrum. We can't see X-rays, ultraviolet, cosmic rays, gamma rays. I mean, you can go on and on and on. And, you know, people, some of the skeptics have said, well, if this is true, then why can't we just measure this with an EEG or a QEEG, an electroencephalogram or quantitative electroencephalogram? Now, EEGs and QEEGs are, are extremely useful diagnostic tools, but 
that's what they're used for is measuring electrical flow through the brain. And there's been a number of neurobiologists. I know that, um, was it um, uh, Joe John, um, uh, gosh, I'm trying to remember his name. He's at, he's um, um, a neurobiologist out of Scotland. And then uh, Professor Shelley Joy in California, they addressed that argument and they said that there are there are forms of electromagnetic energy whose harmonics are so sensitive they're beyond the range of our technology to detect them. And so just because we don't have the technology to detect something doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I mean, think about, and, and you brought up a very good point, Paul. You said that physics changes in the extreme. Well, physics also, or rather our understanding of it, changes due to technological advances. If you look at Sir Isaac Newton, who for all intents and purposes created physics, he believed that everything was, to, you know, on the, the molecular level was just a miniature version of our world. Right. And but if he would have had the benefit of an electron microscope, which wasn't invented till well over 200 years after he died, then he would have thought very differently about this because he didn't know about quantum physics. Also, there are um, string theorists, and this has been circulating for some time now with um, people like Max Tegmark, um, even Stephen Hawking, Michio Kaku, the string theory is that there's not just one universe, but there's several different universes. And they've proposed a theory that the laws of physics may actually be different in alternate universes. So, I mean, I know we're getting kind of far out there with that, but, but what it comes down to is our technology is constantly expanding and growing. And just because we can't tune into the EMS right now doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't exist. I mean, think about what were stars before the invention of the telescope? I mean, people had, there were holes in the fabric of heaven. They were spirits. I mean, th there's all these, what we would now consider bizarre theories. Then the telescopes invented and it's like, whoa, there's other planets, there's other suns. So it's just simply a matter of time as our technology is expanding. I think we're living in a very exciting time technologically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I interviewed Michio Kaku one time, and one of the things he said was, is, if anyone says they understand string theory, they don't. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, what's funny is um, Werner Heisenberg said the same thing about quantum physics. Yeah. And when I was working on the afterlife frequency, I was beating my head against a brick wall, you know, metaphorically one day. I was trying to figure out this one concept and I'm doing my research and I see this quote that said, when you think you understand quantum physics, you really don't. And it was Werner Heisenberg and then Michio Kaku saying the same thing. Yeah. You know, you, you think you start getting it and then, you know, so, so, but, but the thing about quantum physics is it explains everything. It's just that we've got to get the technology to detect it. Well, I want to quote my friend Raymond Moody too, uh, who said the, the proof, essentially, the proof in the afterlife is a philosophical question. Yeah. Is that, am I right about that or did I screw that up? I think that's right. That's right. It's, uh, you know, a conceptual question. Who knows what? The, and I was wondering too about uh, the, um, uh, how did you formulate it, uh, Mark, uh, the, um, about the, the last point you made? I love your exact words. Um, what, what the, um, what, what, which point? The electromagnetic soul or quantum? Or the limit? Uh, yeah, and if, if um, they said if you think you understand oh, yeah, yeah. quantum mechanics you don't you don't yeah and i was wondering if the other way around is true if you think that you don't understand quantum mechanics maybe that means you do <laughs> <laughs> well you know that makes sense i mean anything that changes the laws of physics is uh is a wowza you know what do we do with this so, so something like that just doesn't make any sense. I heard Dr. Kaku say 
you know, the two most uh, powerful explanatory theories ever devised are the general relativity theory and the quantum theory. But the trouble is when you uh, combine the equations, the result are, is unintelligible nonsense was the word he used. So, um, and yet, you know, we go on sort of taking those theories, uh, you know, seriously anyway, just because it doesn't make sense now, but we kind of feel like it. Well, go back to 1915 in your mind and be an educated, well-informed person of that era and listen to this sentence. All four of Ethel's grandparents perished and were lost in a shipwreck long before her mother and father were born. In 1915, even to a very brilliant educated person, that's unintelligible, makes no sense. Now add the discovery of the role of DNA and heredity, the cloning, uh, gene editing, gene engineering, and you can you can now put together a scenario in which that would be true. It does make sense. It hasn't happened yet. Or go back to 1915 and listen to this. I watched a movie on my phone this morning. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that was, uh, since you don't have to go back to 1915 on that one. Well, that's yeah. a very good point because in, in, I think it was 1926, Nikola Tesla was being interviewed and he said that with advances in telephony mm -hmm. and television, he said the eventually the whole world will be a universal mind. And a little thing ah. in your hand. Right. And small enough to fit in a man's yeah, breast. Exactly. <laughs> you know? He was quite a guy. God. Yeah. I mean, so so people look at that or or go back to 1915 and try to explain to someone a microwave oven. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to put this pile of popcorn, press a button, and... <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yeah, so, so the thing is, these are just... I mean, a cell phone. I mean, it's miraculous technology. One of the... the if you guys will, will bear with me for a minute. People say, well, you can't communicate with spirits. And I say, well, it's all about energy transfer. <clears throat> and they say, well, well, what do you mean? Well, think about making a cell phone call to your Aunt Martha in England. So what, how does that work? Well, your brain sends an electrical impulse to your vocal cords. So electrical energy gets turned into muscular energy. And, and another electrical impulse makes your um, lungs contract. So that muscular energy forces wind past your vocal cords. So now the muscular energy gets converted into sound wave energy. The sound wave energy then hits the plate in the speaker, turning it into mechanical energy, which is immediately converted into electrical energy, which is then converted into radio wave energy, which then hits a tower, taking it from a radio wave energy to electrical energy to a collection point, which then beams it up to a satellite via radio wave energy. Then it goes through a network of satellites being converted from radio wave to microwave energy to a particular collection point that then converts it back into radio wave energy, which goes to a tower, which converts the radio wave energy into electrical energy, which goes to another tower, converting that back into radio wave energy, which hits the cell phone of Aunt Martha, and uh, radio wave energy becomes electrical energy, which causes a plate to vibrate, taking mechanical energy, now becoming sound waves energy, which hits her eardrum, and that sound wave energy becomes mechanical energy as the, as the stapes bone hits the eighth cranial nerve, taking that mechanical energy, turning into electrical energy, which goes into her brain and is converted into to hi aunt martha and all of that occurs at 186,282 miles per second the speed of light and that's the laws of physics energy is neither created nor destroyed only transferred from one form to another this as dr moody so absolutely correctly pointed out in 1915 was pseudoscience fantasy at best science fiction and now it's one of the most irritating things of the 21st century. 
<laughs> so, Mark, I know there are going to be people in our audience who are going to want to know how can they make this communication happen for them in terms of the spirit world. And you have an acronym RAFT, which I just thought was very useful and accessible because some of this discussion is way out in the stars. But many people just want to make contact with their Aunt Mabel, right? So can you just talk a little bit about RAFT and can an ordinary perfect person make contact with spirit? Yeah, I... I um. I was trying to figure out how to explain that. I was, you know, here in my office working on the computer and I said, how do I explain to people who aren't mediums how to recognize signs from spirits? And I hit the writer's block. My head just, you know, I, I just could not. So I thought, all right, I can go for a walk on the beach. <laughs> okay, there's that back on the beach. So I'm heading down my driveway and I start getting cold chills and tingles. Now being a medium, I realized, oh, okay, there's some electro electromagnetic activity and I'm directed in the opposite direction, away from the beach to this bike path. So I'm walking down the bike path, and all of a sudden I see these two objects glowing in the light. It's about 11 in the morning. I walk over to them, and it's a nickel and a penny. So both my parents are in spirits, and I go to bend over to pick them up, and I hear my mother. Okay, now she was of Italian descent, and I hear, if their head's down, it's bad luck. And I start laughing because the Italian side of the family has a superstition for all occasions. <laughs> okay. Then I hear my dad's voice. It's money. Grab it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm standing there and I got this nickel and this penny in my hand. And I look at it. And I go, oh, six cents. <gasps> six <laughs> cents. And I'm like, okay. Okay. They're trying to tell me something. And then the chills and tingles flooded my body. And I saw an image of my father standing in the ocean up to his waist holding this blue canvas raft oh. that he had when we were kids. It's now, my dad was a Navy SEAL. He was a NASA engineer. He used to teach kids how to swim. And I'm getting raft. And then I got it. I got it. He was teaching me how to recognize signs from spirits, accept it as real, feel it without overthinking it, and trust in the message. So, and, and my parents walked me through it, okay? Um, I knew when I was getting the tingles, okay, I was recognizing a sign from the spirits. When I saw the coins, I accepted it as real. When I heard Sixth Sense and then saw the vision of my father, I felt it without overthinking it, because it's the third step, feeling without overthinking. Oh, this is just a coincidence. Yeah, it's just a couple coins. Oh, that's just a memory of my dad. That's where people go wrong. They begin to hyper-analyze, and they create a block, and then trust the message. And so the RAF technique can be applied not just to incidents like that, but if you have a dream. And, and you know the difference between a dream and a visitation, because when you have connection with a loved one in a dream, it feels real. Mm -hmm. You know, you wake up and go, God, that was really mom talking to me. And you can use RAF to interpret that. I've talked to many um, near-death experiencers and, and said that in the wake of your NDE, you can apply RAF to help you understand the messages that you receive during your NDE for people who didn't necessarily have an NDE, but were part of somebody else's, meaning a shared death experience, you can apply it there as well. So the RAF technique um, has been employed by a lot of people since, since I went public with it to help them recognize, accept, feel, and trust. And I want to talk just for a moment about trust. <laughs> we live in crazy times. Interesting, technologically fascinating, but crazy times. Messages from the divine, messages from God, messages from spirits are never about anger, bigotry, hatred, or violence. It's about love, healing, peace, resolution. So if you think you're getting some type of spiritual message to tell you go blow something up or start a riot or be violent, that's not a message from the divine or from spirits. That's a message from the ego, edging God out. It's a creation of the human brain which did not create your spirit, it merely hosts it. Messages from spirits are always positive and uplifting. And I've conducted over 15,000 readings in my life. I've connected, I've tried to estimate, it's got to be at least 100,000 spirits. And I've yet to have one say, hey, tell this kid to go put on a bomb vest and blow up a school. Yeah. It never happens. Amen. Oh, I found that too in my research with terminal lucidity and people's final words. When you look, when people come out and they are lucid again, 
they're rarely like, oh God, that man you married was a son of a, you know, it's always forgiveness or advice or don't forget about the file I left in drawer number one, you know, things like that. Just very concrete um, uh, advice or always loving, always loving. Yeah, I, I had a man um, tell me recently, he said that um, he's been coping with a lot of guilt. He was a caretaker for his father and, and he was definitely um, going through caretaker fatigue and his father was getting forgetful, was dying of cancer. And, and one night in a fit of anger, he said, I wish you'd die. And he didn't mean it, but he said it. And he, he, then he held his father and said, I love you so much. I'm so sorry. And, and his father died about a month later. And every day he made sure he told him he loved him. And he said, I've just been racked with the guilt. He, and he said, and recently um, I was motivated to go for a walk on this pier, this pier, this fishing pier where I lived. And I walked out to the end of it and there was nobody there. And the sun was reflecting off the water. And then the patterns on the water were the strangest I've ever seen. They all became like circles of light and they were shining right at me. He said, I've never seen anything like this. And he said, I heard my father's voice say, I know that you were tired. I know that you were angry. I know you didn't mean it. I love you. I forgive you. Mm -hmm. And this man just broke down sobbing. And he said, I know that sounds silly, but I really really think that was him and and he said mark i recognized the sign from the spirit i accepted it as real i felt it and i trusted it mm -hmm. and let me tell you when i heard that i <laughs> i started i started getting teary-eyed it's a great story well raymond has worked a lot with this with the psychomantium right people uh what trying to get forgiveness from their parents or uh yeah yeah people come for all kinds of reasons and uh, the context of this is i as uh, uh lisa and paul know i am such a bore because all of my interests stem from ancient greek philosophy essentially but uh, in ancient Greece, there were these places that were very important in the origin of Western thought, which were called oracles of the dead. And um, so to make a long story short, I uh, read a, a report in a classical archeology span journal in about 1986 or seven. And uh, through a series of events, just sort of, from reading about the excavation, just put two and two together and figured out what they were doing. And uh, basically it has to do with something that's still practiced in various parts of the world today, where, for example, you'll, they'll take a silver bowl and highly polish it on the inside, fill it with olive oil and, and a candlelight and, uh, in a dark room, uh, many people under those circumstances see visions. So uh, kind of figuring out that's what they were doing, I set it up and found to my astonishment it worked. Um, Paul and I wrote a book about it about almost 30 years ago, now, Paul. Wow. And, uh, but it's subsequently been uh, replicated by a lot of people. I, I think the most, um, astonishing thing to me about it was especially since the initial folks who I took through this were my graduate students of psychology and then as word spread a psychiatrist friend of mine and a, a sociology professor just some, some medical colleagues heard about it and wanted to try it too but um People go through this, and, and again, to my astonishment, I was assuming anybody who had this experience would say, well, you know, I saw an image, it looked like grandma, but whether it was real, I, I assumed they would just sort of not kind of just say, well, I don't know. But in fact, uh, to, uh, to my utter astonishment to this day, people take this to be a real event. And... Uh, so where I've come, and perhaps you too, Mark, have uh, I just come to accept that 
the 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 line between here and there is it's shifting. It's um, it depends on um, all kinds of things on your perceptions. Uh, it de depends on your stage of life. The older they get, people sort of they become sometimes you see in the hospice almost walkers between the worlds, right? Like people going between here and and wherever grandma is, you know. So yeah, I mean it's shifty. I've kind of decided you can't figure it out. Um, but you can get some intimation of it. So yeah. so it Raymond, let me ask, okay, that it was a piece of silver that you polish and put olive oil in and people can see spirits in it. Yeah. It's uh, that it's, you can do it with a mirror, which was what yeah. I used. Yeah. Although actually when I started doing this back at the mid eighties, um, some of my students tried it with the cauldron. There wasn't much of a cauldron, it's like this big around. But they just wanted to be more authentic, and they tried it. They polished the inside of this thing, and and you know it worked. They, they said so. Um, but yeah, you can use it with the uh, you, uh, the mirror is the more convenient way to do it. And this sounds astonishing in twenty twenty two, except that if you went back to eighteen twenty two or even eighteen ninety two. Everybody knew about this. This was a folk custom uh, that you would um, have the mirror on the wall and by candlelight, sometimes you would use a chant to, um, to bring about the state of mind, uh, like a, something almost like a nursery rhyme with nonsense syllables or what you are, which is what the Greeks did. You can get these formulae, which uh, just, it doesn't mean anything, but it just puts your mind into the framework where um, your mind kind of apparently passes over. And, you know, I mean, I've got to the point where, okay, you know, I, it's, I see, I've, I've been over there a couple of times myself and uh, uh, you know, and you know what can you say it's uh, like at a certain point like the man you mentioned i just uh, to me it is now a fact of experience i'll tell you why you're absolutely correct this is um um something i've been working on a lot of people report seeing a deceased loved one in their peripheral vision and then they turn and the person vanishes so I started researching this and astronomers have developed the technique called averted vision. So when you yeah. see a comet, if you look at it directly, you can't see it very well. You have to look at it with your peripheral vision. And it's the same thing with spirits. Here's why. It's the structure of our eye. In the center of our eye, in, in the pupil, we have uh, cones. Cones are for seeing color and um details and that's daytime vision and in the in in the periphery of the retina are rods which are designed to see light and dark and that's why when people see spirits out of peripheral vision they tend to have that transparent grayish smoky white look casper the friendly ghost okay um type and it's the same thing when you look in a mirror it artificially recreates the averted vision. And so what the ancient Greeks and what you've been doing is doing the same thing. So you actually are seeing the electromagnetic light, electromagnetic energy of a spirit. It's just that because it's so subtle, that's why you're seeing it in this polished object, be it silver or the cauldron or a mirror or out of your peripheral vision. And, you know, because I've been on a lot of paranormal investigations and, and I've seen all this and I'm like, so people say, I turned and, and my loved one vanished. No, they didn't. It's just that you switched from observing them from the, the rods to the cones in your eye. And so I think that, I mean, not only are you onto something, but you're proving this theory. It's so. Yeah, you know, I was, say, I was thinking when you were saying that, Mark, I 
Cheryl, who you, I think you met Cheryl. Yes. Uh, she was, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Cheryl is, I will say, like very brilliant. It's not something she brags about, but her IQ is literally astronomical. But she's, she's also not intellectual. She, you know, she went to art school, okay, and fashion and stuff. Okay. So, but, but, you know, Cheryl is is grounded in a, in a you know in a very sort of concrete way. And about two years ago, I went through a spell of seeing dead people. And I, you know, I mean, at a while you have to think, well, why? I mean, I'm seeing dead people, all right, but it's not bringing my life further along. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was. I really went through, and there they were, just drifting through. Yeah. And then I brought it up to Cheryl, and she said, "Yeah, yeah." She acknowledged, "Yeah, me too." She, she had been going through that recently, and um, it is just the most uncanny thing. It makes you think of the stories of the, uh, the, and I've heard this from occasional people with near death experiences who who have the cardiac arrest that lasts so long that it doesn't, you know, it does, it's impossible. I knew a friend, a, a wonderful general practitioner just told me about this friend of mine who was, her cardiac arrest lasted for 40 minutes. And I mean, it just sort of blew this, this Dr. Nelson away. And, um, so the people like that who go talk about a layer of existence where people seem to be kind of wandering around, not realizing they are dead. Homer described that in the Odyssey and Book 11 of the people who were, uh, you know, the famous one is Sisyphus who rolled the stone up. Yeah, hill, and then it would come back down. But that people seem to be um, kind of focused on some unfortunate thing in their life, or it's like George Ritchie saw this too. And my friend that I was describing, the woman with the forty-minute cardiac arrest, but that there's some people who just don't seem to get it that they are dead, and it's kind of like they need to wake up, and. Um, and yet it's not dire. It's like George said, a lot of these people say that it doesn't seem to be regarded as, as anything very serious it, because they say that in and among those people who don't get it, that they're dead, there seem to be other enlightened beings who are kind of trying to wake them up or get their attention. So this is a pretty complicated and wild thing we're living in. But, uh, you know, why, why should this story from the ancient Greeks show up in the deep south in the 1970s? You know, it's talk, maybe a, a, a considerable number of people with these extremely lengthy cardiac arrests came up with the same image. So, you know. What is all, all that about? And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> and I also kind of think that maybe from with this frame, within this framework that we can't know. Maybe, you know, it's, uh, I think it's possible that there's the, un, the comprehension of this is, is, has to wait till you get over there, kind of, I mm -hmm. think. Uh I, I would agree with that because while we're here in the material world and our brain is, is a finite perception device, our soul may be an eternal, immortal living spirit, but it also appears that while we're here, we're supposed to be having a finite experience and that when we revert to a purely infinite state, because I've asked them, I, I said, well, well, what do you do over here? You know, there and, you know, I, cause I want to know. <laughs> and the general consensus is you can't even begin to understand it. And I'm like, but you always say that. <laughs> <laughs> and, but and, it's and, true. 
because <laughs> it's true, right? Probably the people, the people who are trying so one-sidedly to understand things are a dangerous group because eventually they will come across somebody who will give them the answer, right? Mm. And uh, I think the, to me, the way of proceeding has always started, it started when I was seven or eight and looking through a telescope had the insight that I would never know much of anything. And um, that I, and I remember that night, I just, uh, and it was a wonderful kind of liberating thing that I, that as curious as, uh, as I was, that I, that there's huge limits to this. I'm just, so to me, it's life has been a process of seeking knowledge, knowing full well that it's, um, it's scarce. Um, we only have a few minutes left and I have two questions I just have to ask you, but if you, I know your time is limited, so I don't want to disrespect your time, Mark Anthony. Do you have, a, no, okay, just. However, I mean, I am at your, your service. Okay, all right, I wanted to make sure because I'm, the two questions, I wanted to hear a little bit about your near-death experience and when you were four and how you feel that may have contributed to some of your psychic abilities or not. But the, the other question is genetic predisposition. You know, I do not have psychics in my family. I would love to be more psychic. The times in my life that I felt really connected to spirit have been the most exciting times in my life. There's just a way life becomes more magical and I feel that way, but I don't know how to get back there. I'll have times like that, then it disappears. So one is, is there a genetic predisposition? Is there some way that I could cultivate my, you know, and those who are watching cultivate our psychic abilities and our abilities to connect with spirit. And then if you want to talk about the role of the NDE in cultivating, you know, psychic abilities. Well, let, let's start with the first, first, we'll start with your second, uh, to be like Groucho, we'll start with your second I question. I get so many questions <laughs> before you go. <laughs> it's funny, I met, um, sorry, I'm digressing. I met James Hong. And he's um, been um, uh, a breakthrough actor. He's Asian American. He's in his 90s. And he said, I'm probably the only living man who ever worked with Groucho Marx. And uh, he was on Groucho's show, You Bet Your Life. He was like a young teenager. And, you know, Groucho was, he goes, my name is James Hong. And he goes, oh, an, an Irish name, I see. You know, something like that. And, and it was just really great. And, and uh, I just recently saw James Hong on, I think it was uh, CBS This Morning or something. And he's still acting and still going strong. So, but, um, but at any rate, uh, to become, see, I'm of the belief that you're either a medium or you're not, but, but that doesn't mean that you cannot have an experience with spirit communication. And that's one of the, the reasons that I wrote the afterlife frequency. And one of the reasons for the raft technique is to tell people or to show people how to, to make the most out of contact from spirits, because we all have it. It all comes to us. You know, it's just that some of us are better at things than others. Like I can swim, but I will never be an Olympic athlete and I can bang around on a guitar, but I'm never going to be a, you know, a, a Jim Chemo West or a, you know, a Slash or a Jimmy Page or anything like that. Um, but meditation and prayer. Prayer is, is a good way of centering and focusing yourself, but meditation is where you clear the clutter from your mind and then you open yourself up to frequency. Also by employing the raft technique, become aware. Um, also in the afterlife frequency, I explain to people how to increase their spiritual situational awareness. And there's many stories about, you know, because it's like me with the, the coins, you know, because I'm experienced with this, I, I, I went through this, but there's so many people who will say, you know, I was driving home and all of a sudden, for some reason, I thought I needed to turn on the radio to my car. And there was the song that made me think of my mother who passed. Now, do you think it was just a fluke? And there you can start applying rap. So that's why I always tell people that spirits around us all the time. We're getting messages all the time. You have to be open to it. And when you start to, to meditate and to, to quiet your mind, also 
see a lot of people go into spirit communication either through a medium or they they say i want to have a spiritual experience and i want to have it right now well <laughs> doesn't work that way because i wrote a chapter called avoiding the no 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 syndrome it's like when people are doing a reading with me and i say i'm getting this does that make sense no 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 i was telling them be careful about doing that because it's after the reading that things begin to unfold and make sense like i was doing a reading with this gentleman and his father's spirit came through and i kept seeing two snakes two snakes now he was good about it. he goes i don't know what that means I said, well, it could be the medical symbol, you know, the staff with the two snakes. He said, I think it's Native American. I said, why? He goes, I don't know. But he goes, but my dad was full-blooded Sue. He goes, I never met him. He died when I was a baby. The next day, he sent me an email. He took a picture out of this book. He I took a picture of a page from a book. In the Sioux language, Sue means two snakes. Now, he didn't know that. I didn't know that. So I love when people go, oh, well, you're cold reading. Really? So how did I cold read that one? <laughs> okay. <laughs> or a mind reading? Well, first off, it was a phone reading. So I don't know how I'm supposed to read somebody's mind over the telephone. And secondly, if it wasn't in his mind, how did I get it? Okay. Because the spirit's transmitting that to me. And see, he was open because some people say, no, 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 and shut their brain off. But it got him curious so he looked for it it can take hours days weeks even longer for the full meaning of a message to make sense and so when you approach spirit communication don't go into it with i want a spirit to say i welcome my loved ones to come forward i am open to the experience because then you're re you're reshifting the energy from a negative tense frequency to a more welcoming energy. And so that is a fundamental stepping stone to becoming more receptive to the messages from spirits and how to recognize, accept, feel, and trust them. When you do a reading with somebody, what, what do you sense? What do you feel? What are your what, senses doing? Well, what happens is I always start with a prayer. Um, I was raised Catholic. I was supposed to be a Catholic priest. So, you know, that's in there. And I wouldn't consider myself necessarily a, uh, um, a, a, Bible a, a staunch Catholic because I take an interfaith approach. I've studied Buddhism, Hinduism, Sikhism, Taoism, Shintoism. I, I like all the isms. And what I do is when I open up my brain to frequency and I can feel spirits connect with me, what happens is first I get the gender of, of the spirit. Secondly, I get an idea of their connection to you. So, Paul, if I was doing a reading on you and I say that somebody's on your level, that means your generation, brother, sister, cousin, spouse, friend, below your level, child, niece, nephew, above your level, parent, aunt, uncle. It's like a family tree chart, okay? But they don't have to be relatives. So a lady on the mother level could be a stepmother, mother-in-law, boss, teacher, professor. So that'll happen, and that happens real quick. They always tend to give me how they passed. I'll feel it. And different causes of death may have a similar physical sensation. If I feel impact my head, that could be stroke, aneurysm, um, head trauma, but it could also be a quick passing because I get a jolt. Burning sensations usually mean cancer, but maybe they were burned or it could be neurological. So it just depends on how and where I feel it. Then they'll start transmitting to me all types of information. I'll see things, hear things, feel things, know things, like the two snakes, um, all types of things. And they may talk about you and what's going on in your life. What's really fascinating is when they start giving me medical information about the person I'm doing the reading for. And I'm always very careful because I have a show that I do every Thursday, the psychic and the doc where people call in and my co-host is a psychologist. And we tell them, you know, we're not diagnosing, but you know, if something comes up, check with your doctor, you know, just got to be careful. But the weird thing about this, Paul, is that they'll start giving me information about medical conditions, genetic anomalies, hereditary problems, issues with them on a cellular level that I don't understand or know about. And then I'll hear from people a, um, a month later, I went to the doctor and they said, that's what you have. You know, so, so um, that's why you have to trust in the messages that they're, they're giving you. And sometimes they'll bring up future events. One of the funniest, <laughs> there's a lot of funny ones, but I was doing a session for these two women who were sisters 
and their mother spirit started giving me information about their other sister. And the other sister wasn't at the reading. And the mom spirit kept giving me Michael, 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 10, 11, 10, 11, October 11. And they were like, come on, Mark, everybody knows somebody named Michael. And I said, like, yes, we do. But they couldn't think of anyone significant connected to them. And they couldn't think of anything in October. So I was telling them, don't overthink it or overanalyze it, because that's more no, no, no energy. Just jot it down. Let's move on. They contact me six weeks later. Mark, two weeks after the reading, Hurricane Michael hit our sister's hometown on October 11th. She went into labor two weeks early and had her baby girl during Hurricane Michael on October 11th. So the mom was trying to give us this information, but why, why would we know, why would we be able to discern that at the time? Hurricane Michael didn't exist at the time of the reading, and that wasn't their sister's due date until it was. And we were joking because Hurricane Michael is a category five. We were like, I guess mom was saying, get her out of there. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's a, a quick, quick tour of, of the way I experience things. I mean, I could go on and on and on, but that's why I explain about it in the afterlife frequency. Uh, sometimes it's not so pleasant. Some of the things that I see, sure, it can yeah. be very difficult, you know, when I'm doing a reading for a parent who's lost a child, um, you know, and, and my background, and you guys are all, all professionals, and we know that in our capacity as a professional, we have to maintain our objective perspective so that we can do our job properly. But I have to admit, sometimes things come through that, that really hit the heartstrings. Hmm. Yeah, sure. You know, um, I want to, we are all writers, we love writing, and a lot of our subscribers themselves have an interest in writing. And one of the questions I always ask our guests at the end is, what kind of advice can you give to those who are watching about following their writing dreams? You're a wonder, I love your writing, by the way, you just, you know how to tell yeah, a story. Very clean. Yeah. very clean and compelling. But what might you tell um, our subscribers about how they can follow their writing dream and make it happen? Yeah, what's your writing life like? Yeah, well, yeah. Well, I, I, I write all the time because I also write for a magazine, Best Holistic Life magazine. So I write articles every month. Um, and I'm constantly doing research. Like right now, I'm working on a presentation that I'm going to be giving for IANS. And um, I think that Jacob's Ladder and Jonah and the Whale may have been accounts of NDEs. Well, in, in the Bible, there may be metaphorical accounts of those. So I'm doing my research there and thinking about it. So I'll, I'll come up with a, a concept or an idea, and then I begin to do the research. But I'd say that the most important thing in writing is that if I can't feel it, then my readers won't be able to. If it doesn't make me laugh, it does, doesn't bring a tear to my eye, if it doesn't resonate with me. Yeah. And you have to you have to be able to connect. Also, I think a mistake that a lot of a lot of new writers, they, you know, they'll say, well, I'm so interesting. I'll write a story about my life. Well, most people don't care about you yeah. unless you're a celebrity. <laughs> OK, I mean, everybody wants to know what's J-Lo doing, what's Lady Gaga <laughs> doing, what's, you know, Harrison Ford doing. But but they want to open up a book and see what does it do for me? How does it touch them? Mm -hmm. How does it resonate with them? What will it teach them? And I think that, that particularly in the nonfiction genre, which you know we're all in, is, is that's, that's the approach that you take. That's great, wonderful. Thank okay. you. Thank you for being so generous with your time and your yeah, thanks idea. Thanks a lot, Mark. And it's oh, a wonderful, my pleasure. it's a great book. Um, thank you, Mark Anthony. Thank you. Um, Raymond, it's so great to see you again. God great bless you. You too. Yeah. You know, it's it's um it's one of the things that you said, Raymond. One of the most powerful things is I don't know. Mm -hmm. no. and, and without that, that's what gets us all studying. You know, nobody has all the answers. We have insights, we're discovering things, and mystery's fun, you know. <laughs> Yeah, that's it. That's what that's propels great. everybody. Yeah, it does. I mean, you know, if we knew everything, it would be well. Uh, maybe that's why we reincarnate. Maybe you get tired of knowing everything on the other side, and you come back here. 
Oh. Right. Could plug the two together. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, thanks a lot, Nora. Yeah, right. Thank you, guys. Yeah. Love you guys. God bless. Bye-bye. Good luck with Bye. the book. Bye. Yeah.